And here we are, 20 years, celebrating the Manchester United Edinburgh Supporters Club. To be part of the dinner tonight is something I'm thoroughly looking forward to. I'm a bit I'm sort of nervous in the sense that there may be some expectation that uh, I'm supposed to be doing some entertaining later on. So we'll have to wait and see how that goes down. He goes, I see you and that he's here, he's there, he's every f***ing where. <laughs> Except where you're f***ing supposed to be. <laughs> uh, it's always a slightly more thought-provoking when you have some ex-colleagues and other people you know who are legends at Manchester United. Oh, so he comes in and he lays into everybody, you'll never play for f***ing the club again, you're f***ing hopeless, and for you, you're less, you're f and yes, for you, you might have scored a f***ing goal, but you're f***ing hopeless. And all of a sudden, ah, aye, good, aye, right. What about him over there? He's sitting in the corner. <laughs> For me, one of the highlights of the past year was the most unforgettable weekend in Edinburgh. Legends of our football club and some of our most loyal supporters from around the world descended on the Scottish capital city for a truly memorable adventure. The weekend was a celebration of the 20th anniversary of the Edinburgh branch of the Manchester United Supporters Club. Superbly organised by the group's chairman, Peter Wood, with fabulous assistance from his right-hand man, Gordon Horn, and their partners, this was a unique, tailor-made weekend that only those who were present will ever truly appreciate. Nonetheless, I'm going to try to give you a taste of just what went down. And this is only a snapshot of some of the highlights I'll be featuring in this series. In this episode, the star of the show is the one and only Brian McClare. One of the most interesting speakers, not least because he takes no prisoners. And it's sometimes hard to know when he's actually joking. A unique form of banter from Mr Chocolate Eclair, jockey to his friends. I've already had a, a, the wonderful experience of being completely and utterly ignored by Martin Buchan. Hopefully it won't be the last time. Martin, I mentioned briefly there about lifting the Cups both in Scotland and in England. That must be very proud for you. You're still the only person, and it's probably unlikely that that's going to ever get broken, that record. Well, you might think it's a wonderful thing, but... I think I slobbed my guts out for 18 years uh, as a professional footballer and I end up as a quiz question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Martin Buchan, ladies and gentlemen, absolutely brilliant. What about that? Absolutely brilliant. Louis, thank you. Martin, thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we move on to a gentleman who Peter referred to earlier on as not only a friend of his, but a legend of Manchester United, a record breaker. And again, as the previous two players, the memories that this man has given every one of us Manchester United fans in this room tonight is unbelievable. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please, let's welcome Mr. Brian McClare. Follow that. Yeah, yeah, very good, I. Yeah. Hi, uh, cheers for that. <laughs> One of the best things that's happened to me recently is that Portuguese <laughs> putting the ball over the net in the Stretford end. So I've now had the second worst penalty <laughs> in the history of Manchester United. <laughs> it's, a, it, it's a real joy to hear people singing your name to a particular chant. 
and like you've done with uh, Lou and uh, Martin. And uh, the thing about that, that, one of the things about what you've just been saying, he's here, he's there, he's every fucking where. <laughs> and uh, when Alex Ferguson, uh, well, he only said it once, you'll need to say it once, at uh, half time, he goes, I see you, and that he's here, he's there, he's every fucking where. <laughs> Except where you're fucking supposed to be. <laughs> And then, and then when you're talking about like, like songs or chants about your name and all that kind of thing, there's some t terrible ones, you know, in the sense of, but at least th th you're singing them about, and I want about Nicky Butt, that sounds as if he's, you're going to a funeral, you know. <laughs> uh, Nicky Butt, Nicky, Nicky Butt, <laughs> Nicky Butt. Like you're, you're, you're in the, th the two cars behind the hearse, you know. <laughs> But one of the other things about that is that in, in Alan Shearer nearly signed for Manchester United. Well, they agreed to come to Manchester United and then he ended up at Newcastle. And he ended up at, which, is, which was a marvellous thing for David May. <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise there'd be no song about David May. You know, so I don't do I don't do after dinner speaking. I just tell stories. But one of the things that I was I've been fortunate enough being on the the boat trip yesterday, which was an incredible day, and somebody asked me about. Um, I bet you wish you played football now, and with all the the financial, uh, well, all the money you can get now, like. 190, 200. Well, they must be getting paid about 300 quid a week now, yeah? <laughs> Plus bonuses, you know? And, uh, and, and, you can, and I thought, well, w w but the, you see all this stuff. You, we've got all this access now to television, football, sorry, and television and radio and all the other mediums you can possibly imagine and the other future ones. And it got me kind of thinking about, well, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't actually wish I played football now because I, I, I would miss out on lots of things that would happen to me now. Uh, so, for example, I cannot see the modern football player being able to interact with ordinary people, like yourselves, right? We're all ordinary people. Yeah. Well... Well, when I say we're ordinary people, Lou and I are ordinary. <laughs> Martin. <laughs> and 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 I should think about well, these are going to miss out on these things. They're going to. I don't know if they'll ever be able to have any of the interactions that we've had, and interactions we've had this weekend. I mean, it's a, it, one of the kind of th great things is about the oldest supporters, Man United supporters branch in the world, coming along to a, a dinner in Edinburgh and being dressed for the occasion. Yeah. <laughs> but if you look at them, actually, they've all got on each other's kilts. <laughs> some are up here, some are down there. Kind of missed out somewhere along the line, you know, that <laughs> what's going on with it? So I took some of my inspiration for to learn a little chat about a lot of different things from the people in the room. So what they're missing out on, for, for, for I can see, to the modern player, uh, are they all friends? Well, I'm not sure we're all friends anyway, but are they all friends? <laughs> are they, do they respect each other? Will they, will they be there when you need them? You know, when it, when it kicks off in the football pitch, will they be at your shoulder? We always, you know, these guys played in teams that uh, you knew that you could trust the person next to you to be there 
and support you if you made a mistake or if it actually ended up in a, a 21 brawl, which it was nothing to do with me whatsoever. <laughs> And uh, and so, so and, and and be able to tell stories and listen and hear stories. So there may be a poetic license because I wasn't exactly there when these. Stories. I'm thinking about the support you give to your teammate, not necessarily on the pitch, but support you give to your teammate. In the uh, in the days going back to the late 70s, and early 80s, coming back from a game as a professional football team was not dissimilar to how you will go to a game on a bus. Loads of alcohol involved. <laughs> this is coming back, not before the game, it's coming back. So you're coming back from it, even more alcohol involved, coming back. And uh, Manchester United, from what I was told, was no different. There was lots of beer on the bus after the game. And, you know, long, a long trip back from London you get into the, uh, not Lou, because Lou's a non-drinker, but everybody else would be getting hammered into the lager and every wine and whatever else is involved in the bus. And they're getting back, they're within about 20 minutes of uh, the drop-off point, which was uh, in Cheshire, cause where all the players lived in, nearly all the players lived in. And Arthur Alberston is feeling a bit poorly. He's, he's actually thinking, and, it, and there was no toilet on the bus, and he's feeling poorly. And he's, he's saying, I, I, I'm struggling here, I, I think I'm going to be sick. No, no, hold on, hold on, Arthur, hold on, it won't be long, there will be 50 minutes, we'll be back at, uh, we'll be back in, check. no, no, I'm struggling. Oh, no, no, I need, I need something, I'm going to be sick, I'm going to be sick. And Lou, being a compassionate teammate, said, hold on, I'll get you something. Arthur's... <laughs> <laughs> Lou goes away up to the front of the bus, comes back, and at this point, he gets back. Arthur's at the point of no return. I've got you something, Arthur. I've got you something. And he hands Arthur a matchbox. <laughs> now, Arthur is no, he's at the point of no return. He quickly fills the matchbox. And the rest of the vomit is all over the floor. So the last, the last 15, 20 minutes of the journey back to the drop-off point is Arthur's vomit sliding up and down <laughs> the bus. There you go, team spirit there. Helping hand for one of your colleagues. That was the only thing you could find. I'm not sure the modern player now would really appreciate that sort of sacrifice. <laughs> and you get to the kind of thing where you, you see, well, there's, they, they don't seem to have any, well, from what I can gather, not a lot of interaction with a lot of people outside the dressing room, you know? And, and I think they sit in their little bits of, they sit in their own, put their iPods in and listen to whatever they listen to or watch what they're doing and don't talk to each other. And they don't have an interaction with, with other people that are involved in the industry. So the industry, as much as you like it or not, the media is a big part to play in it. All sorts of different media. Now we had to deal with media in various different ways that we would uh, often would get stitched up by the media because we'd tell them we would do a story and you get hammered by the headline, you know. I remember uh, when I was at Celtic, uh, somebody asked, a journalist asked me about... Um, well, well what, was your, what would your ambitions be? And I think I, I also said, well, at the time, the, the, the Premier or the, the kind of top league in Europe was the Italian league. And I think I must have said naively, well, yeah, I would like to go and play at some point in the Italian league. And the headline came out that I'm headed for the, you know, and I'm like, oh, fucking hell, can't believe that, you know. <laughs> so the, the 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 game I'm playing, the next game I'm playing, it's it's Dumbarton away, which is quite close to Milan. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm not having the best of games. 
And one of my things, if I watch things in me, and I, I was always wanting the game to get, get, keep going. Get, even when I scored a goal, I wanted the game to continue. I used to run at the goals and get the ball out. I used to go and get the ball to get throw in, get the ball put on the corner spot and all that kind of thing. At Dumbarton, I went behind the goals to pick up the ball. And uh, there's not a huge crowd there at Dumbarton. I pick up the ball and I just get up and this guy standing right there in front of me goes, why don't you fuck off to Italy now? <laughs> Well, yeah, a lesson in, in dealing with the media. <laughs> Martin, again, I'm, I'm, I might be poetic license, is stalked by a journalist, probably well, someone from a posh paper, The Guardian or The Times or Financial Times, <laughs> or some Aberdeen paper. And he turned around and said to Martin, Martin, excuse me, Martin, he demanded something. Being polite, he goes, yes, can I help you? He says, uh, can, I, uh, can I ask you something, Martin? He goes, yes, of course you can. He says, can I have a quick word? And Martin says, yes. Velocity. <laughs> That's fucking brilliant. <laughs> I've never been able to use it, I've never been able to do it because <laughs> plagiarism, you know, never really, never really steal that from him. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was Gordon that told me that, yeah. That, yeah. Oh, Gordon may have, but he pinched lots of things. <laughs> Just talking about Gordon, I mean, remember my story, but Gordon Strack is the manager of Celtic. Two of, the pro, two of the funniest people that I think I've met in football or come across in football are two gender nuts, Strachan and Tommy Burns. And uh, Strachan's the manager of Celtic, and Tommy had been the manager of Celtic, but he's on now Gordon's staff, he's his first team coach or whatever. And they're playing against Celtic Park, and uh, the game's not going that well, and the punters are getting on to Gordon, and they're giving him all sorts of peddlers from behind the dugout. And Tommy Burns is standing at the other side of the dugout, and uh, Gordon's kind of not quite sure what to do, kind of change this, will I, get, will I take this person off, or will I move this one? And out of the corner of the eye, he sees Tommy Burns walking down the touchline and he feels, oh, fucking hell, here's Tommy, he's going to give me, he's going to solve the problem for me. He's been the player here, he's been a manager here, he's going to quieten down all these bastards that are giving me this fucking stick. So Tommy wanders down the tunnel slowly, gets to towards Gordon, puts his hand over his, Gordon's ear, he goes, I know where the trap door is. <laughs> Everybody thinks that Tommy's told them exactly what to do, and Tommy just wandered back. And uh, I, I, I don't know how they got on, whatever happened to, the, to happen to that story, but that was you know, just, yeah, Gordon did like a bit of plagiarism. So then I thought about other people that are involved in, in people that are here. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on now. In fact, next week I think there's a, a lot of things about uh, how we can save the planet and how we should be uh, saving and how we should sort out energy. And we know we won't be able to afford any fucking energy soon <laughs> by, by the gas prices and all that kind of thing. But, but um, another one, of my, well, one of my friends and colleagues is here today was, was well into saving the planet 30 years ago, in that he wore the same pants every day. <laughs> and he would show you the evidence <laughs> that he wore the same pants. Y fronts as well, not the <laughs> traditional Y front. Every day. Norman. And then later on, later on, the Norman was doing some uh, journalism for the Manchester United magazine. He would interview a player over lunch, and I went, I went along to speak to him uh, in Altrium, and 
he uh, took me around to the side of the the, the uh, venue, which was a pub. <laughs> and he said, look, he said, look. And I looked into the car park and there's about seven or eight cars. And right at the back of the car park, there's a car. He goes, that's my car. <laughs> and I look, oh, that's, that's a nice car, that. Four flat tires. <laughs> Filthy as fuck. <laughs> he goes, that's mine. I've not driven it for seven months. <laughs> He'd already thought about the environment. <laughs> Carbon footprint. <laughs> so Norman Whiteside is there before. <laughs> All these other people are talking about Norman, green. Oh, sorry. Oh, Northern Ireland green, sorry, green. <laughs> when I went to Manchester United in 1987, I got romanced by Alex Ferguson. Romanced by him, telling me all these wonderful things that were going to happen. A lot of them did happen, but I thought, fucking no chance of these happening. <laughs> and his number two at the time was Archie Knox. <laughs> so I went on to realise later on, so I got romance and wooed by, I wooed by Alex Ferguson. Thought he was a nice guy, lovely. Archie took us back to the uh, airport and Archie, and I don't think it was, I think the words came out of Archie's mouth, but they were Alex Ferguson's words, <laughs> where, get a fucking shave. <laughs> get your fucking hair cut. I thought, oh, fucking right, okay, no problem, you know. Like, so, bad cop, fucking worst cop. <laughs> I hated training, right? I, I, I must have been doing something right because they kept picking me, but I fucking hated training, right? If the ball wasn't about, I had no fucking interest in it, the ball. Well, cones running this, whoosh, timing, pff, fucking knowing. Just get this over with, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Pre season, roasting hot, we're at Littleton Road, 12 minute run. Right, so you've got to fucking run as fast, far as you can for 12 minutes. So we set off running, and all the fucking teacher's pets, Robson. <laughs> Strachan. Olsen. They're all in a fucking pack at the front. I'm thinking, I'm not fucking running like this for 12 minutes. <laughs> They're looking forward. I'm looking backwards. I look backwards. Jim Layton, that'll do for me. <laughs> Jim's fucking 100 yards behind me. I thought, ah, oh, fuck it. Finish in front of him. No problem. So, jogging, well, just kind of running around, roasting hot. Archie's got a whistle. 12 minutes comes. Archie blows a whistle. I'm 100 yards, maybe 110 in front of Jim, feeling good. Jim's away over there, they're fucking away over there somewhere. All the fucking teacher's pets and all that. Like, stop. <sighs> Thank fuck for that, you know. I stop, hear a shout. McClare! And look over. Archie. Yeah. Keep fucking running. <laughs> all right. Is it fucking 12 minutes or what? You know, like, <laughs> keep you fucking running. All right, so <laughs> I keep running. I've got to run past all the fucking teachers' pets who are pissing themselves laughing. <laughs> Him and the manager fucking snarling at me. <laughs> he makes me run the furthest you can possibly be away from the exit to the fucking training ground. I got way up to the fucking furthest corner. And he blows the whistle again and he shouts, stop! 
So I'm oh, fucking brilliant, you know. So I walk all the way back in, I'm still there. And I get right next to them, I go, I, I must be the only fucking player in history that's run a 13 minute, 12 minute run. <laughs> And then you consider the other things, you know, there's, there's, when the young players used to have, and I'm sure these guys did have when they were at Celtic and Aberdeen jobs to do, that you, you should never be, you would never be, shouldn't be doing anymore anyway, but I still think it's some kind of discipline that young, young players should, should have with the idea that you work hard at some particular thing. If you do that really, really well, if it's cleaning somebody's boots, then if you're really, really good and you're really determined to do that, you might have a chance of being successful in the life. And uh, so when, when Archie was at Rangers, Glasgow Rangers, <laughs> with uh, Walter Smith, who he left Manchester United to go to Rangers for money. <laughs> Which is fine, at least he's always admitted it. He went for the money, yeah, was, you can't argue with that. That him and Walter would, would get the kids to make them uh, tea and toast in the morning. And I don't know if you know this, actually, or not, but the kids, several of the kids, when they're making tea and toast and toast for you in the <laughs> butter, they spread the butter on your toast, <laughs> they would lick the butter. <laughs> and take it up to the office and go, here's your... Gaffer, here's your toast. Archie, here's your toast. <laughs> so for three or four or five years, I don't know how he's still alive, actually, with all these. <laughs> these kids licking. <laughs> well, I don't, well, I don't know who they were. I'm not going to out them. You, 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 it's up to you to resolve that scenario, you know. And hopefully you're not feeling ill at this particular moment. And I don't know if the players, you, know, you watch, if you, we all watch the football, you either be in there at Old Trafford, you watch it on the television. And sometimes when I'm watching, uh, not, not just with Manchester United, I'm watching all sorts of, of football teams and I'm wondering if the, the support staff will be as vociferous as the likes of Archie was when he was assistant to, to Walter and, and indeed to Sir Alex, because Alex Ferguson picked people who, who would challenge him who he wanted to give them, he wanted to, them to tell him, what the fuck are you picking them for? <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, and have an argument back and forth. When, I was sometime, when I'm watching the football, and I'll, I'll use United for an example, I'm looking at um, Michael Carrick, who was a great player for Manchester United, and you've got several other players, and, I, and I'm not sure that any of them are turning around going, what the fuck are you doing? Ronaldo, you're dropping them. What the fuck are you doing, you know? And uh, I don't know well, sometimes, well, mm, is that what they do or they not do? Will they ever do the situation where, well, they'll never be in this anyway because it'll never ever happen again, is that uh, Archie and Alex Ferguson played for Manchester United when they'd finished their careers in Bermuda. <laughs> in Bermuda. We went to the first season I'm there, we go to Bermuda and... Uh, it, I don't really know that, what it was supposed to be, but it was a fucking great trip. <laughs> and uh, we played we played two games there. It must be money spinning things for for uh, Martin Edwards, whatever. And uh, <laughs> and uh, we're there, and uh, with with various different things, with with uh, injuries, with, uh, illness, uh, reluctance to play. Oh, and, uh, and Clayton Blackmore got arrested. <laughs> so, Archie came on in the first game as a sub, and he, he, he started and played in the second game and scored. Now, he, he scored a goal, right? He's, my, Alex, Archie he has scored a goal for Manchester United. He's going to go, right? Now, Archie will tell you it was a fucking magnificent effort, stepped inside somebody, saw the goalkeeper, Give him the eyes and smash the ball the other way. (laughs) 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 
因为想安全。And uh, it was a toe banger. That's his score. Toe banger is a box. Fucking toed it straight in the top corner. Archie's Sir Alex Ferguson now is assistant manager, and he's Fergie comes on the pitch with about 20 minutes to go, and Archie thinks it's a good idea to tell us all not to pass the ball to him. For some reason, we all think that's a good idea as well. <laughs> and we didn't fucking pass the ball to him. He's making, and I'll give him credit, he was making some great runs. He's t turning for a 45-year-old, spinning round, and he's fucking raging every time. <laughs> nobody pass, oh, pass the ball there. No, no, no. Oh, oh, pass the ball there. And we, we never passed the ball to him. I don't think that's happening so much now in football, you know? Where you, Complete and not of contempt for the manager by not giving the ball. So that's Archie Knox for you, you know. <laughs> Clear, simple, straightforward. Would anybody like to hear a story about anyone else? <laughs> well. <laughs> Who? Cantonar. Who's that? What story do you want to hear, Peter? <laughs> oh, no, the, the, sorry, the other thing about it was there's a video. There was a video of Archie scoring a goal. What happened to the video? <laughs> what happened to it? Well, um, <laughs> 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 Listen. I've got to say, you chalky, it was a far better bloody goal than that, by the way. <laughs> so you know, I played about three one twos from my own box right up the pitch and then bent it in the corner right in the top corner. Uh, fantastic goal. But apparently they were taking the videos of this match and uh, comes to the end of the match, so I immediately go to the people that are, you know, doing the television and stuff like that. And I said, uh, any chance of getting a video of that? He says, uh, we've given that to Mr. Ferguson. I says, oh, cheers. <laughs> <coughs> so I go to Alec and I said, uh, see that video? I says, have you got it? He says, what video? <laughs> I says, the video of the match. Never got a bloody video of the match. So he did away with the video of the match solely because I scored. And I told the boys no, I passed them. <laughs> I was gutted. I could have... I could have got, got a first team place at Bermuda if I had played my cards right. <laughs> <laughs> He said there was no. He was said there's no. He was going to tell that story. So <laughs> pretending he's shy. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go in a minute. I'll finish off with uh, Eric, but I'll just tell you talk about uh, Alex Ferguson. Uh, people ask, me, "Well, what's he like?" It's impossible to, to sum up what he's like. But I would say he was hard but fair, and I've always felt that he was. Uh, lucky, and I think he—I don't know—I've never had that to you that he's. I think he he signed players he thought were lucky, in that they'd won things in the past. That's maybe one of the reasons why he signed Cantona. You know, because whoever Cantona was, despite his behaviour, he won things, or the team won things that he was involved in. You can't count Marseille because they already know what the score was going to be before the game kicked off, <laughs> <laughs> which had a terrible effect on Archie really in the European Cup semi-final, you know. But but I thought he was uh, Ferguson was hard at fair. He made he made difficult decisions 
he but he probably made the right decisions and although actually we probably disagree with one in the sense he left Jim Leighton out of the FA Cup replay team. Uh but they won we won the game and sort of well, whether it proves or not it was the right decision or not, it doesn't really matter. But and I used to ask uh, some of the people who were friendly with uh, Fergie, you know, that uh, what was it? What would you say was was his magic? What was it he was like? And, and all of them, his friends and some of his family, say he's a lucky bastard. <laughs> and I says, well, how can you? How can you quantify? How do you quantify luck? He says, well, let's tell. Let's I'll tell it like this. See if he fell in the fucking Clyde. When they fished them out, he would have a salmon in either pocket. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that's 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 probably just about right. Attention to detail. Doing the, the talks before the game, always meticulous, identified players that you had to stop playing, and his team talks always lasted for about half an hour. Boring as fuck they were, but <laughs> I used to listen and we're away at Tottenham and we're in the hotel and he, he would do the, the, the team talk in the hotel because he thought that all the away dressing rooms were bugged. <laughs> or there'd be somebody listening underneath, somewhere lying underneath, the, <laughs> hiding in the bath or whatever. He just, so all the away games, the, ho the hotel... The, 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 the team took us down the hotel where it was important about what we wanted to do. Playing Tottenham away, an evening match, he, he goes into, he names the team and he's talking about everything that's supposed to be happening. He's wandering away and he's in about 10, 12, 13 minutes into his team talk and he's there and I'm looking over here. And I'm aware that he stopped talking. So I uh, turn my head back to see what the situation is. And he uh, he's fucking glaring at me. He goes, what did I just fucking say? <laughs> so I started at the beginning of the team talk. And I got about 30 seconds in. Fucking stop. <laughs> Clever. <laughs> so it just goes to show you don't have to actually be looking at somebody to be actually listening to the pish they're talking. I suppose the only thing you can really talk about, Eric, is that night at Selhurst Park. Oh, no, no, I've got one thing otherwise. One of the other things I was going to say about the beauty of being able to involved and being involved with all you lovely people in here and be able to interact with you all is that when I'm at Highbury, and it could have been 87 or 88, and a guy comes in, a scout comes into the dressing room with a father of a young boy, and this young boy with spiky blonde hair is comes into the dressing room and you look down, you get introduced to him and he's looking up and you can see in his eyes, I want this. This is what I'm going to do. And that's David Beckham and his dad, who's always been a United fan. <laughs> okay, right? So maybe we'll be involved in a scenario where you see Ted Mac Beckham. And you may, some of you might see or might not see, but I'd search it out if I were you, <laughs> wearing a pink sporran. You might be ugly, but you give a good blow job. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful experience for me to be able to see that, right? I get, I get put on the pitch at uh, Selhurst, Pass, Selhurst Park against Wimbledon as a substitute. And Alex Ferguson's commands are fucking slow down the game. We've won the fucking game. Fucking get it tight. Stop them fucking doing this. Stop fucking doing that. Right, okay. And I go on the pitch and I was trying to pass this message. Going, the game's won. Like the gaffer's like, hey, right here. 
and uh, the ball comes to me and, and I hit this magnificent, I don't know, seven inch pass to David. <laughs> And as you do, what well, I was always taught was that the game's, game's simple. You pass the ball to somebody, and then you go like this. <laughs> you make yourself available, give me it back, and then you pass it to somebody else, and then you kind of move away somewhere else. <laughs> Thank you, right? <laughs> so this is what I'm expecting. I've given the ball to David, right? I go to the other side of the opponent, gives the ball back. Well, he's just inside just inside our half, and I'm watching him. I know what it's like, because I've been playing from the, in the reserves for a number of years, training in the reserves, and I'm watching him going, he's going to fucking shoot. <laughs> <laughs> All I've got from the side of me is, he's told me, kill the game, won the game, get it, Campbell. He's going to go fucking mental. <laughs> It's going to be my fault, because I've given them the ball, <laughs> albeit very, very short pass. And sure enough, he winds it back, and he fucking launches it. Then you're going like that, and like that. That's not bad, that. <laughs> and we've also had a wonderful support at Selhurst Park, at Crystal Palace. Or Wimbledon. It was amazing the number of United fans that can get in there. And they, they start cheering at fucking 60 yards away. I'm going, fucking hell, that's gone in. <laughs> and I made the mistake, that I made a very naive and elementary state by jumping on his back. <laughs> and that's one of the things you see that, uh, that throughout the, the premier years, the wonderful things that I could actually jump. <laughs> I wasn't thinking, what a fucking fantastic goal. I'm thinking, fucking hell, Scottish goalkeeper. And it was Neil Sullivan, who was Scotland's number one at the time, who was in goals for, and that's the thing, it's kind of my head. And at the same venue, of course, you've got the, the night where Eric Cantona got sent off. He got some poor treatment by some very poor Crystal Palace players, and he decided that he wasn't having any, and so he trampled all over one of them. <laughs> and uh, the referee saw it and uh, sent him off the pitch. And then the game gets kicks off again, and then there's a fucking noise from the side of the pitch. I didn't actually see it because being a true professional, I'm concentrating on what's happening. <laughs> and you turn round, and Eric's he's standing at the side of the pitch. Now, it's a little spark, several of you have probably been there, but the take of that side of the pitch, there's a drop of about two feet, maybe three feet, you know? And you're looking, oh, Eric's, Eric's standing there, and he's obviously, not the, not that pleased, you know. Norman Davis, who had been escorting him from the dugout to the dressing room. I mean, Norman at the time was about 70. He's the kit man. What the fuck is he supposed to be doing to stop him doing? <laughs> so the game finishes. We managed to, uh, David May scores a late goal. We managed to wrestle a, a point from the game. We're coming off the pitch, and uh, Gary Walsh, who was the sub goalkeeper that night, said, what, what happened? He goes, uh, you won't believe this. Eric's kung fu, the guy in the crowd. I says, you're fucking right, I don't believe you. I was at uni, I did physics. There's no way he could have kung fu somebody. A karate kicked someone and fucking landed on the pitch. In the period of time, I've gone like that. You know, it's not, yeah, it's not happening. I'm fucking telling you, wait till you see what's getting back. No. Then a few other people have said, yeah, he did it. And I was thinking, nah, it defies the laws of physics. So I'm not having it. But if he's done it, wow. <laughs> We've all thought of doing things like that. Sometimes to our own supporters. <laughs> but none of us have ever done it. But he's done it. Think, oh, this is, this is out. And, and Eric had never had a row 
a bad word to say to him by the manager. Well, certainly not in, in the confines of the dress room. We thought, well, he's going to get it now. If, if, fucking hell, if that's what he's going to get, is that he's going to get at least a row, <laughs> if not a fucking tumultuous purple-headed hairdryer. He's <laughs> got to get it, you know? So we were like, well, bring it on, whatever he's got to be saying. Fucking hell, he's getting the... He's got to, this is, wow, we like that. Ho, ho, <laughs> <laughs> So we came into the dressing room, very small dressing room, and uh, Ferry comes in, and, and he fucking, I don't know, I don't know, he might have had somebody to help him, but he slams the door open, and then he comes off the hinges, so he must have somebody to help him, but he slams, <laughs> fucking slams it, he fucking slams it shut. And there was always different shades of colour in the, in the manager's face when it came to when you were getting, uh, you know, so you'd like, you would have red, more red. <laughs> uh, purples, right? <laughs> Incandescent purple. <laughs> but we're thinking, fucking bring it on, you know? So he comes in and he lays into everybody, you'll never play for fucking the club again, you're fucking hopeless, and for you, you're less, you're f and yes, for you, you might have scored a fucking goal, but you're fucking hopeless. And all of a sudden, ah, aye, good, aye, right. What about him over there? He's sitting in the corner. <laughs> he's sitting over there, he's kind of a bit sheepish, you know, and they say nothing, he said nothing at all. Fucking lays into everybody. We're not bothered, right? You tell us as much as you want. If you're getting this because he scored a fucking goal and we're still on the pitch, we well, might not be very good, but he fucking kicked somebody in the crowd. <laughs> right? What are you fucking going to say him? <laughs> oh, brilliant. Right, so he gets f he's exhausted everybody else. Oh, here it comes. Oh, what joy. <laughs> this is something we've been looking for for a couple of years. He's got away with loads of other shit, right? He kind of got away with this. He goes over to Eric and he pauses. And we're like that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Eric, come on, this is going to be a hell of a fucking hairdryer. <laughs> Eric looks up, poppy eyes. You can't be doing things like that, son. Is that it? We're not looking at you so much. <laughs> Fucking hell, that was that. <laughs> right, I think it's uh oh, well, thank you very much for listening and I hope you've enjoyed it. What about that, ladies and gentlemen? He says he doesn't speak a lot at dinners. How good was that? Brian McClare, everyone captivated, hanging on every word. And I'm so pleased that Archie came and gave him 50% of his material. Archie Knox, ladies and gentlemen, as well. Thank you. Cheers, jockey. Absolutely great.